This is a fractal called a Koch snowflake. It is intricately detailed, requiring a huge number of turns to draw. But surprisingly, it only requires a handful of lines of code to render. This is the Towers of Hanoi puzzle. You must move all the rings from peg A to peg B, and you can use peg C as a scratch space, but you're never allowed to lay a larger ring on top of a smaller ring. This solution seems complex and almost chaotic, and yet it only takes a handful of lines of code to produce. These are both examples of recursion, where an algorithm refers to itself when completing a task. Some problems are so well suited to recursion, with their solution so concise, it almost feels like magic. But of course, it's not magic. In fact, as we'll see later, the fundamental mechanism behind recursion is actually built in to the CPU itself. To illustrate what's going on, let's consider a basic problem in computer science, reachability. Imagine you have a set of vertices and a bunch of edges that connect some of the vertices together. This is known as a graph. Let's say you start here in the lower left corner at vertex 0. What are all the vertices you can reach if you're only allowed to travel along these edges? For computer science students first encountering this problem, it can seem quite complex. But there is a recursive solution that is so simple, it looks like we're cheating. I like to think of this as the curious cat algorithm. Let's watch it in action. Our cat starts at vertex 0. It can go up or to the right. It has to pick some direction, so it goes to the right. Now it has no choice, so it goes up. Now it does have a choice, so it just picks a direction. It keeps on going until there's nowhere new left to go. Since the cat doesn't want to visit a vertex twice, it won't go to zero, and there's nowhere else to go. So it starts to backtrack until it has a choice again. No choice here. From 15, the cat could backtrack some more, but it doesn't have to, because there's a choice it hasn't tried yet. Vertex 16. So it goes to the right. And again, it keeps going deeper as far as it can, until there are no new choices left. Now it's out of choices again, so it starts to backtrack. But only just enough until it gets a new choice to explore. And here, a new choice. So the backtracking stops, and our cat gets to explore deeper again. And once it's cornered, it backtracks again, just until there's a new route to take. This pattern continues. Explore an arbitrary path as deeply as possible, then backtrack just enough until there is something new to explore, until finally everything has been seen, and the cat backtracks all the way back to zero. Now, what remains? We see that only vertices 2 and 6 haven't been reached, but all the other light gray vertices have. So our reachability problem has been solved. Surely the algorithm for this complex procedure will be very long, with lots of cases to consider, right? Actually, it's astonishingly simple. This is it. Let's walk through it. We're calling this procedure DFS, for Depth First Search. The V stands for the vertex we're starting at. Our first step is to mark V as visited. In our illustration, we're using the light gray color on the vertex to mark it. This lets us know that V is reachable, and we can eliminate it from the vertices left to explore. Now we form a list of all the edges coming out of V. These are the choices our cat has to explore. For each of the edges, we'll use W as a way to refer to the vertex the edge goes to. We only care about this new vertex W if we haven't seen it yet. So if it's new to us, then we just rerun DFS, but this time with W as the starting vertex. That's it! Doesn't seem possible, does it? I mean, what about all that backtracking? 
What about that rule that we backtrack just enough until there's a new choice, and then we try that choice, etc.? Where is all that? Well, it might help if we unload the dishwasher. When we take out the plates, we stack them. With each new plate, the stack grows taller. When it's time to eat dinner, the first plate we remove from the stack is the last plate that was put on it. We have stacks in computer science as well. They're great at remembering what we were doing when we got sidetracked to work on something else. If you've ever used the back button on your internet browser, you've used a stack. It lets you go back in time, returning to web pages in order from the most recently visited page to the least recently visited page. When we add to a stack, we call that pushing. When we remove from a stack, we call that pulling or popping. Just like those plates, when we pull from a stack, we always remove the item most recently pushed. Each time a routine gets called, a new item gets pushed onto the stack to hold its state. When DFS is called for vertex 0, we'll push information for that call onto the stack. This includes the vertex, 0, and the list of neighbors our cat wants to try, in this case 1 and 7. Our cat chooses to try 1 first. So that means that when we return down to zero later on, the stack will remind us that we were going to explore seven next, assuming we haven't gotten to seven some other way by that point. But before that happens, we're exploring one, which means we'll need to go to eight. There's no other choice. Once we're at eight, we need to explore 15 and nine. We'll pick 15, so when we get back down here, the stack will remind us to check out nine. This process continues as each call to DFS makes another call to DFS. But what happens when we reach 7, and there are no neighbors of 7 left to try? Well, that just means DFS for 7 is done, so we pull its state off of the stack to take us back to 14. It turns out that DFS for 14 is also done, so we pull that off the stack to return back to 15. Now 15 is not done our stack will remind us that we still have to visit 16. So we push the state for 16 on the stack, and we're back in exploring mode. This process continues, where we explore as deeply as we can, and then backtrack just enough until we have more choices to explore, and explore those as deeply as we can. This might still seem like magic, like there's some extra hidden stuff running behind the scenes to make this all work. So to show there's nothing up my sleeve, we're going to go all the way down to the lowest level of programming, assembly language. You don't have to know any assembly language to get something out of this. Just keep in mind that this kind of code talks directly to the CPU, with no other layers helping out. We will be using assembly language for the 6809, the CPU inside the old TRS-80 color computers. The key thing to get from this section is that even back in the 70s and 80s, the CPUs themselves had a stack built in, which means the hardware itself made recursion fairly easy. For our assembly language program, we'll tackle a simple problem. Given a list of numbers, find the smallest one. Our recursive approach will use the very routine we're writing to find the smallest number among the slightly shorter list of all numbers except the last one. Then all we have to do is compare that minimum with the very last number. Whichever is smaller will be our final answer. The code is so compact it all fits on the screen at once. Assembly language is notorious for being verbose as each instruction does very little. And yet, this is still all the code we need for a recursive solution to our problem. The CPU has built-in scratch space called registers to help us keep track of what's going on. Each register can be used to store and retrieve a number. The S register tells us where the top of the stack is. Whenever we push something onto the stack, the S value moves to a smaller number to indicate that the top of the stack just moved up. When we pull something from the stack, the S value moves to a larger number as the top of the stack moves down. Our code will also use the A, B, and X registers. 
and we won't even need the other ones. To see how this works, we'll step through the code one instruction at a time. Although the code would work on any list of numbers of any size, we'll just use a small list to keep things simple. The code that calls our new routine, which we'll call min, is shown here. It is responsible for telling min about the list it will process. You'll see the registers already have some old numbers in them, even before our code starts. Even the stack has something on it. But these values are irrelevant. We're about to put our own numbers into the registers once our code runs. The X register is loaded with the location of the list in memory. And the B register is loaded with the index of the last entry in the list. Our indices just count the number of items in the list, but we start counting with zero. Now that B and X are loaded up, we can finally enter our min routine. But first, something to look out for. The next instruction after the call to min is finished will be this RTS, which is located at this address in memory. As soon as we enter min, you'll see the stack jump up by two slots, filled with 3F and 07. This is how the stack helps us remember what to do when a routine is finished. By the way, in spite of the letter F, 3F07 really is a number. It's just in base 16, which is a more compact way of representing numbers and is quite convenient with assembly language. Now we're in min, and you'll see the stack is helpfully remembering the address to return back to once we're all done with min. First, we ask if B is zero. If so, that would mean there's only one item in the list, and that item would therefore have to be the minimum. No need to do any work in that case. But for now, we know we have three items, indexed 0, 1, and 2. So B is 2. So we prepare for our recursive call by saving our state onto the stack. This pushes the value of B, which right now is 2, onto the stack. We want our recursive call to look at everything except the last item in the list, so we change B from 2 to 1. This way the recursive call will only look at items in slots 0 and 1. Now it's time for the recursive call. Let's actually step into that call to see how it functions. Notice the stack jumped up another two slots. This time it's remembering where we were in the first call to min, in preparation for making the second call to min. Again, it tells us where to return when this second call to min is complete. Now B is 1, as we're only looking at the first two items. Again, we ask if B is 0. It's not. So again, we push B's current value to the stack, decrease B from 1 down to 0, and we recursively call ourselves again. Now B actually is 0, so we just skip down here. We get the item at slot B from the list and put it in the A register. Remember that in this call to min, we're being asked to find the minimum from a list of just one number, 50. So the answer can only be 50. The A register is where we hold our result, so it's good to go. Then we return. Watch the stack. The address at the top is what tells us where we were when we made this call, so that we know exactly where to return to. You'll notice the stack still has plenty more of our numbers in it. That's because we're not done with all the calls to min, just the most recent one. So we return back down to the most recent place min was called. We had previously pushed this call's value of B onto the stack, so now it's time to pull it off the stack. We see that B has gone back up to 1. We can now compare what the recursive call just returned, which is 50, with the item at slot 1, which is 20. 20 wins, so we fill A, which is our result, with 20, and return. Now we're back to the next most recent call to min, and now it's time to restore its copy of B from the stack, which is 2. Now compare what the recursive call just returned, which is 20, with the item at index 2, which is 30. 20 wins, so A already has the correct answer, and we can immediately skip down here and return. Finally, we're back at the initial code, and the A register is holding our answer. Whew, that was a lot. Even if you didn't understand every little step, hopefully you noticed the following. We were talking directly to the CPU. Nothing else was running on the computer to help us out. No magic. 
As we kept calling men with smaller and smaller lists, the stack grew and grew, leaving a trail of breadcrumbs to remind the CPU how to go back. Once min was called on a list of only one number, it was time to start returning back the way we came. We pulled addresses and state off of the stack to remind us what we were doing, so we could compare what each recursive call returned with the last item we were considering from the list. Along the way, the A register got closer and closer to the answer. If this was all too easy for you, here's a quick puzzle. What if you wanted to write a routine that found the largest item from a list instead of the smallest? What is the tiniest change you could make to this original code to achieve that? For the answer, the code used in this video, and also another bonus assembly language recursive routine, see the link in the description. In this video, we explored some problems that are uniquely well suited to recursion and how a routine can be referenced by itself to solve a slightly smaller version of a problem and incorporate that result with the rest of the problem. We gave a feel for what recursion is like, showing how we get deeper and deeper to attempt smaller and smaller versions of the original problem and then backtrack to incorporate those intermediate results as we return to larger and larger versions of the problem. And finally, to show that there isn't really any magic, we showed how the stack built into CPUs enables recursion at even the lowest level of coding, assembly language. <laughs>